Well, good morning. morning. You might notice that Bob is doing uh, extra duties today. He's leading singing and he's trying to run the stuff in the back and all those good things. So uh, make sure to appreciate him for all that he's helping out with today. Uh, You know, I I didn't realize until, uh, I'll be honest, I hardly ever realize until it's almost too late that we've got a holiday weekend coming. And I, and I usually try to incorporate it in some way into my sermon, and uh, I just not even thinking about it until I saw someone say, hey, I hope everybody has a good Labor Day weekend. And I'm like, oh, man, I didn't even realize, and I always forget, and this is the month my birthday's in. You'd think I'd remember what goes on in this month, but I don't. But it is Labor Day coming up, and actually one of the cool things is when I was looking at it, the very first Labor Day parade, before it was even a federal government issued day off the very first labor day parade was today september 5th 1882 it's been that long that this has been a part of our society a day that we get to distinguish the the dignity and the value of going to work of working to provide for your family of working to take care of your family i know a lot of times we like to put labor day towards Uh, those who actually leave the home and go do the work. But trust me when I tell you, if you are a a mother or a father that stays at home and takes care of your family and takes care of the stuff around the house, you do more work than we do when we go to work. That's the truth. And so Labor Day is to show and distinguish not only the work of those who go out to earn the money to provide, but those who do the work at home, and it should be. All those who do the work at any point in time to take care of their families, to take care of the needs that their family has. I mean, that's why we work, isn't it? I mean, we don't go to work just because we like spending a bunch of time doing something that maybe we love doing, maybe we don't love doing. We go to work because we know there's a need for it. We go to work because we understand that it brings value to our lives. It helps us prepare for the future. A lot of times what we don't, a lot of people will say when they've retired, you know, they don't, you know, every day is a day off now. It's not the same as when they would go to work. Well, what did you work for all those years for? Ultimately, so you could rest eternally. We're going to talk a little bit about that this morning. We're going to talk about wells and I'm going to, I'm going to tell you how we're going to connect wells to all of this because it might sound a little silly. But one of the things that we were going through in in our class on Sunday morning in Genesis chapter 26, we got to a point where Isaac was going in and he was redigging the wells that Abraham had left for him because the Philistines had stopped him up. Why do you need a well? What does it provide? It provides water. Something that I'm pretty sure none of us can live without. I mean, I'm pretty sure none of us can live without it for more than a few days. I know you can go with, without food for a while, but water is important. We've got to have the water. And so they go through, and what you'll see Isaac do is he makes sure that he has these wells. Why? So that he's ready for when he needs the water. He doesn't wait until he's thirsty and dying of thirst to start digging. As soon as he got to where he was going, he would dig. Now, unfortunately for him, the Philistines fought with him over that, and they, you know, he had to keep moving and dig another well, dig another well. But he kept getting those wells because he knew that he needed it. This morning, I want to talk about these wells and why we need them, but how we can be digging them. And I I want to talk about it in the sense that, you know, when it comes to the work we do in our physical lives, we work so that one day we can be retired from that work, so that our families will be provided for, so that we don't uh, have to worry and stress over them being taken care of. But in a similar manner, we also work eternally. We work so that one day we can be at rest with God. We need to work so that one day we can be with God in heaven, so we can have that eternal rest that Hebrews chapter 4 talks about. God wants us to be there with him. But we need to prepare now. If we don't prepare now, then we're going to be falling short when the time comes, because let me tell you, when the day comes to go to his father, if you start digging your well that day, it'll be too late. So let's talk about the work that we're going to do. First, I want to bring out the fact that we do need these wells. I mean, obviously, in real life, we need water. You know, some of you may understand the need for wells better than others. Some of us are on city water. Some of you might have wells that run your house. 
But I'll tell you this, probably none of us understand or appreciate the need for water as much as they did back in the days of the Old Testament. Because you're talking places that didn't have easy access to water. There's places in the country that you can still go today that do not have running water. Think about that. The things that we take for granted today that are essential to our lives, that some people don't have easy access to. And they put the work in to make sure they get it. And by what I, what, what I mean by that is you'll see people that'll walk hours to the closest river to get pots of water, to get vases of water, get all the water that they're going to need for that day. And then they carry it all the way home. And they do that every single day. It's so important. It's so needed. But when we're talking about the, the, the wells that we need for our spiritual life, the wells that we need to go towards eternity, let's talk about the day of judgment. I already kind of made mention of that. But there is a day of judgment coming. Whether we want to admit it or not, whether we want to talk about it or not, there is a day coming. It's going to be a day of salvation for some. In Matthew chapter 25, you're going to see that it's a day where some people are going to hear really good news. Some people are going to hear things like, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the kingdom of rest. But there's going to be some that are going to hear news they don't like to hear. There's going to be some that are, are told to depart from me. You didn't do what I asked you to do. You didn't care about people in the way that you were supposed to. And so where are you going to go? He says, depart from me and go to the place of eternal fire. That's not what we want to look forward to. That's not what we want to do. But there is a day of judgment coming. And we need to understand that we need to prepare for that now. Like I said, we can't wait. If we wait till this day comes, it'll be too late. Keep that in mind. There's going to be times of temptation in our lives. This is why we need these wells. No matter who you are, and, and Christians may be more so than people who aren't, only because the devil doesn't really have to worry about tempting those who aren't Christians. He already owns them. But the Christian life, whether we like it or not, is fraught with temptation. Temptation is, a, is just a part of who we are. Jesus has tried to help us understand that. Paul, the apostles, have tried to help teach us that. But it's not for any particular reason, but there are a few that we can point out. There's temptations that come because of the devil. He himself, it says in 1 Peter 5, is our adversary, walking about like a roaring lion, looking for who he can devour. He is coming after you. He's going to bring temptation on your life. But the other is because of ourselves. Say, Paul even talked about times where he would struggle with physical things, fleshly things that he didn't want to struggle with, but he would struggle with it anyway. Because his, his mind and his body had desires that he didn't necessarily want to give into. And that doesn't mean he did give into it, but the fact is he had those struggles. We do too. We all have things that we desire, things that we struggle with, whether we want to admit it or not. That don't line up with what God has taught us to do. How he has taught us to live. And because of that, temptation comes into our lives. And so whether it's the devil putting things in front of us that he knows we will desire. Or whether it's our, ourselves allowing things like that to be in our presence. Those temptations will come. And so we need these wells so that we are prepared for when those days come. So that we have the strength to stand up against them. The truth is, temptation should not be taken lightly. I know many of us probably don't think a whole lot about temptation on a daily basis. But if we don't really give, give thought to the temptations that are in the world, the thought to temptations that come against us, it's going to be really easy for the deceitfulness of sin to harden our hearts and us to not even think about it anymore. It'll happen and we will give into it and we won't even know. Because we're taking it too lightly. Don't allow yourself to be that way. Temptations are things to flee from. Think about what Joseph did when, when he was uh, tempted with the wife and he ran. He didn't stick around and try to explain or he didn't, do, he didn't want any part of it. He didn't take that lightly. He got out of there. Don't put yourself in positions where temptation will have a chance to overcome you. Know that it's important that we flee from it. 
There's also going to be periods of tribulation. And I know these might sound similar to each other, but they're very different in a lot of ways. One of the things that we can say, whether Christian life or regular life, life's not easy. We, we all have been through something in our lives or, or our families have been through things. We understand that Rick and Brenda are going through things. We got members who are going through things that are difficult right now. The trials and the tribulations that we are going through are going to be diverse. What you go through is going to be very different at times than what I will go through. The point being, we are all going to go through things. And these tribulations are going to test us. They are going to tax us. There's many people who go through things and come out on the other side stronger in God. But in like manner, there's many who come through those things and completely go against God. Who decide to leave God because instead of having their trust in God to care for them no matter what happens, they look at God and they say that you did this to me and it should have never happened. And how can I love you that you allowed this to happen? We have a whole world that thinks that way. That's not the way it's to be. We have to make sure that we are digging our wells, that our wells are dug in advance so that when these droughts come, when these times of tribulations come, when, they, when these attacks come on us, we are ready. We have access to what we need so that we can have the strength that we need. We can have the encouragement that we need. So let's talk about digging those wells. When it comes to digging those wells, we're talking about preparing for judgment. We're going to talk about the same things we already have been. We're talking about preparing for judgment. Well, first, when it comes to any part of life, when you're preparing for something, especially eternal life, remember what God has already provided for you. Let that be an encouragement to you to know that you're not alone in this. God is helping us through. First, remember that he has provided his son, his son who is an atonement for sin. Someone who has taken us the sin out of your life, who has given you reconciliation and access back to God. He provided that for you. You don't have to dig that part of the well. It's already there. Also know that he gave us the good news. This is also connected to his son. The good news of salvation, specifically in Mark 6, uh, 16, I want to bring out the point that it's salvation for all. It's not limited to anybody. God has dug this well in a way where all can have access to it. It doesn't matter who you are. You can prepare for judgment day by going to the well that Jesus has dug with his own life. We also need to realize what we need to do. Not just remember what has been done, but recognize that and then know what we need to do after that on our part. We need to respond to that good news. In Acts chapter 2, we most commonly recognize 238, where it says, Come, repent, and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But when it comes to responding to the good news, guess what? It shouldn't stop by you responding only one time and getting baptized. That's where it starts. But you need to respond every day. This good news of Christ, that he is your savior, that he is the one who dug these wells that helps you get to heaven, should be something you're responding to and is the reason why you live the way you live every day. Respond to the good news. Do your part. Believe it. Remain faithful in our devotion to God and our service. Put him first in our lives. Put Christ first in our lives. That is the part we have to do. He's already dug that well down for us. We need to make sure that what we're doing more than anything else is actually drinking from it. Don't let the well be there and ignore it. It's there so you can have life. Jesus says that I am the water of life. It will quench your thirst. Are you going to drink of that water? We also need to talk about preparing for temptation. We can do this too. These wells will help us with that. Again, remember what God has already provided for us when it comes to temptation. He provided his providence in time of temptation. That means he's uh, not going to allow you, if you look at passages uh, like James or others, where it says he's not going to allow you to be tempted more than you can overcome. He will help you. 
through those things. He's not just going to leave you alone. He will always provide a way, for, a way for you to get out of that. But at some point, you have to realize that you have to choose to get out of it. He's not going to stop everything from happening. Life is what it is. But he's going to let you decide if you want to give in or if you want to get out. He'll provide a way. But you have to choose that way. He also provides his spirit to help us overcome. And this is a powerful thing that he provides. He provides us his spirit so that we can strengthen the inner man, as it teaches, I think, in Ephesians. And, and he also provides his spirit not only so it can strengthen the inner man, but so that it can help give us an understanding of what we need to do, how we need to be. You know, we'll talk a little bit later about being filled with the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit is going to help us in more ways than you will ever know. And he has provided that for us. If you will accept it, if you will allow it to work in your life, it will help us overcome. He has provided uh, his family to support us. That is God himself as the father. That is us as brothers and sisters. And then the biggest part of the family, the last thing he provided, his son. His son who considers himself a brother to us. Part of our family. He, he gave us his son who is an advocate and a propitiation for us. I want you to think about that for a second. That means what he has provided for us is someone who will always be standing there at the ready to help you. When you fall, when you struggle, he'll be there for you. But also he's still a propitiation. He still covers those sins. We're not going to be perfect. And we're not trying to claim to be perfect. We're going to make mistakes. That doesn't mean that it's okay. That doesn't mean we condone it. Like Paul says, shall we go on sinning? May it never be. Just because grace can abound. That's not the point. We, we try to do our best. But what this is saying is that Christ has covered your sins. Even if you become a Christian and you make a mistake, it doesn't mean you're lost. He will cover that sin too. But you have to be willing to take his hand, to get back up and follow him again. So let's realize what we need to do when it comes to preparing for temptation. We need to pray. Stanley just talked about how important prayer is. It's more important than many times we even realize. We need to pray as Jesus did that we don't enter into temptation in the first place. Pray that. Now it might still be happened and if it does... Pray that you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit so he can help you overcome. And being filled with the Holy Spirit does not have to be um, some miraculous thing that a lot of us maybe, maybe think about at times or the world might think about. It doesn't mean that we have to be filled in this way where all of a sudden you just have all these answers that come from nowhere. Whenever it talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit in the Bible, Paul gives us ideas of what it really means in Ephesians. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, he talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit is the idea of singing praises, making melody in your heart to one another. And then again in Colossians, he, he gets into the idea that it's about letting the word of Christ richly dwell within you. If you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, fill yourself with spiritual things. Fill yourself with the word of God. Fill yourself with the singing of praises to God. Pray to Him. Pray with each other. Sing with each other. Teach and admonish one another. Focus on the good spiritual things that He has given us to do. That is what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Strengthen our relationships. That means strengthen, as I said, with the family we have. Our family involves God. It involves Christ. Strengthen your relationship with them. Walk as close as you can to them. Connect, communicate with them. Pray with them. But we are part of each other's family as well. Strengthen that family. Grow closer together. Because God has provided us with each other for support. The fact is, is if you try to go through this life alone, there's going to be a lot of difficulties and a lot of hardships. But it can be so much easier when you know that you have so many people who love and care about you. Don't throw that away. Don't look down on that. 
That's a special thing that many people don't have in this world, that don't truly understand what it means to be part of a church, to be part of the church as part of the family of God, brothers and sisters in Christ. Take it seriously. It's important. It'll help you prepare for the future. And finally, when it comes to that idea, as like I said, the Son is there to be our advocate and our propitiation for us is what God provided. But then what we must do is when we do make that mistake, he will still cover those sins. But we have to repent and confess what we did. We don't just get away with what we did. We have to turn back to God. We have to be willing to own up to the mistakes we make. It's not about being perfect, but it's about owning up to it and saying, I messed up. But I love God and I want to continue to walk with him. And guess what? He will take care of you if you do that. You are not lost. It's not about being perfect, but it's about making yourself right with God when you make that mistake. That's what it means to be a Christian. Let's talk about preparing for tribulation. Again, remember what God has provided for us. He provides us hope to help us endure. A hope of eternal glory a hope of eternal life something to actually look forward to something that should give us the endurance we need because we have something so wonderful to look at he offered us peace or provided us peace that can only come from christ a peace that passes all understanding as the bible points out you know we live in hard times and and you could probably say that about any era in the world there's always difficulties going on. Maybe sometimes it'll be more difficult than others, but we live in a, lot, in a world that is stressful, that comes down on us all the time. And one of the ways that we can get through that is by finding that peace that Christ gives. And, and what that means is that you don't have to worry about what happens in this world. Truly, not in the end. None of it really will matter. All that matters is that you live your, your life for God. And he will take care of you. The only other part to that is to try to bring as many with you. Make sure that they know what's truly important. It's not about the money we earn. It's not about the things we own. What does Jesus say on the Sermon on the Mount about all that stuff? It's all going to rust. It's all going to be gone. It's not going to last. This whole world will eventually burn up. Nothing is going to matter. What really matters, what can bring true peace, is the fact that Christ has died for your sins and you can be reconciled with God if you're willing to drink the water that has been provided. We also need to understand that he has provided us strength that is also found in Christ. A strength to get through all things. We have that famous passage that a lot of people like to quote, sometimes out of context. And, but it's a, it's a good passage regardless. It's Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's a powerful verse. We can find strength in Christ. Ask for it. Pray for it. Let him give you the strength that you need. And finally... He has provided, once again, brethren to comfort us in those times of tribulation. You know, there's a few times in the Bible that it talks about this comfort. It talks about how there's comfort that can come from God, that can comfort in a way that no one in the world can. But it also teaches that we need to comfort each other with the comfort that God has given us. The idea is that we've all been through things. And no, we might not understand exactly what someone is going through because it will be different. But God has comforted us through what we've been through. And so he asks that you use that to be there for someone else. You don't have to have the right words to say. You don't have to say anything at all. Be there. Show them that you love them. Show them that you comfort them. That's how we can prepare. And that's how God has provided us a way to prepare for those tribulations. So what must we do? Well, let's realize that we need to focus on that hope. By that, I mean focus on God. He has given us a hope of eternal life. That good news that many want to hear. But we're only going to ever truly hear it if we prepare right. And if we want to prepare right, we need to focus on Him. We need to focus our lives on His Word. We need to nurture our peace. Allow that peace to really 
become everything in our lives, to stop worrying and stressing over all the little things that happen in our lives from day to day. You're not going to be able to control it. None of us have the real control that we want to have. The only one who has real control is God. So if you want peace, live your life in the one who is in control. Real peace can be found there. Nurture that peace. Develop our strength. Again, this is strength that comes from Christ, but that doesn't mean we can't work on making it stronger ourselves by praying and asking for more strength, especially in those areas where we're weak, but even in the areas where we're strong. Don't neglect any area of your life. You need to be growing in all of them. Continue to develop your strength in Christ. Continue to walk in the way that you should and maybe help strengthen others along the way. Develop our strength in the ways we can. And finally, build our network of brethren. And by that, I mean get into each other's lives. Know who each other are. Maybe even build up your network with members from other congregations. You know, one of the most joyous things to me is when I go on a trip or I go visiting somewhere and I get to visit a congregation and I realize that I can sit down and I have brothers and sisters that aren't all in one place because they love me and they care about me just as much as the place I come from. And I care about them in the same way. And guess what? There's good churches all over the world. Those brothers and sisters may not know your name, but they are your brothers and sisters nonetheless. Build up your network of brethren. Show them that you love them. They love you. Find a way to get that support that you need in whatever you're going through. Because there are going to be tribulations in this life, and I'm sorry to say that. It's something that I don't wish upon any of us. But it is the way that the world works. So be ready to have support when you need it. And be ready to support those who need it. That's what we need to do. In the end, I hope that you understand that with everything I've said, truly, we're not the ones digging the well. Not really. God has dug the well. He has provided us everything that we need. And that water of life that comes through his son is there. The real question is, are you drinking it? Or maybe our situation is more like Isaac. Maybe because of our own neglect or our own uh, reasons or whatever it might be, maybe we've allowed someone or ourselves to come along and stop up those wells. Are you prepared to re-dig them out so that you can once again get access to that water of life? That has been closed off. Don't stop up those wells. By neglecting God. By neglecting all the things. That he has provided you with. Focus your life on him. Focus on what he has given you. Because even in the end. We can see that God has given this to us. In Isaiah chapter 12 it says. Then you will say on, the, on that day. I will give thanks to you O Lord. For although you were angry with me. Your anger is turned away. And you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and song. And he has become my salvation. Therefore, you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. Are you drawing water from the springs of salvation? Are you allowing him to be the God of salvation that you need? Maybe you have drawn from those springs. But maybe you stopped at some point. You responded to that gospel the first time and you took that drink and you thought, that's all I will need. Don't be that way. Don't stop up that well just by not thinking about it. Drink that water every day. Drown yourself in it if you have to. Make it everything you need in this life. By that, you will find salvation in him. Again, these wells are important to our lives. And we were talking about Labor Day and we were talking about how we work so that we can rest. Well, even God rested after working when he created the world. But in the end, God offers a one final rest and he wants you to be a part of it. But you need to prepare now and prepare by drinking from the springs of salvation that he has given. If you're here this morning and you are not prepared, don't wait till it's too late. 
a day will come where you can't prepare anymore. Maybe you're here and you have drank from the well of salvation and maybe you've turned against it or plugged up the hole. Let's redig that hole today. Don't turn away from God. Know that he's here to give you rest from your labor. But you've got to do your part. He's given you the well. You've got to choose to drink from it. If you have a need at all this morning, I hope that you will come as together we stand and sing.